Hello everyone, Yellarigu Namaskara. I do hope you are all staying safe. Here we are again at BIC innovating new ways to stay connected through this pandemic, though we do miss our auditorium. So today we are going to talk of hope and of positive change. But at the outset, of course, let me say and let me be very clear that the last few weeks and months have been horrific for millions of people around the world and lakhs of people in our own city, Bengaluru. We all know what the lockdown, the pandemic and the anxiety have, have wreaked on people, uh, especially the poor migrants, laborers, the elderly, the sick and the vulnerable of all kinds. And until we have some hope of a cure or a vaccine, um, and of course, there is some touch wood good news on that stuff. This anxiety will continue. We all know that. And some of us will have to bear the brunt of the burden more, which means that those of us like me who are more privileged have to really reach deep into our hearts and our pockets to help others as much as we can. But still, during these last few weeks, people here in the city have experienced many positive and sometimes unexpected changes. And many of us can witness this difference. For example, you know, all of us, clean air, my goodness, it's gone back to the Bangalore of old. We have seen pictures of our own city river, the Vishabhavati, flowing clean and clear with fish. And you can see the bottom of the river after so many years. We can breathe, we can smell the flowers, the trees, everything is blooming in the spring and summer birds and insects such as I've never seen before. Even in our homes, we, especially the elite, have had chances to learn many new things about ourselves, right? We have rediscovered how to bond with our families. We have begun to work as a team. We have acquired new respect for all those around us, those who we took for granted. Some of us have learned to work from home. Almost all of us, rich and poor, have reduced our consumption of material things and have begun to relook at what consumption even means. And to be fair, many of us have reached deep into our communities uh, to help, to bond, and to be inspired by our interconnectedness because clearly we are all in this together. So the world is different and our gaze is fresh in many ways. So today's program, I hope to focus on the positive changes that we have experienced. We will try to understand these changes, but more critically, we will ask our panelists, how can we sustain these positive changes? How can we stop ourselves from going back to business as usual, as soon as the lockdown is lifted? How can we remember to be grateful? How can we remember to reduce our imprint on the earth? How can we heal this earth? How can we continue to be inspired by our mutual dependencies? And we are going to look at five sections today. And I'm hoping to keep it very much city focused because this is the Bangalore International Center after all. So we have Veena Srinivasan of Atri who will speak to us about the environment. Uh, Manu Chandra, uh, our favorite restauranter, will talk about our new, newly discovered relationship with food and also with those who grow that food for us. Uh, Ravi Chandra, lately of BIC, but uh, uh, will return briefly to his old altar as city activist and, you know, one of the leading reformers of this city. Uh, Nitin Pai will examine things like the future work in our city. And last but not least, Tara Chako will talk to us and dwell on the changes in the family and in our community. Thank you all so much, my five panelists, for being on this show, especially Ravi, a special salute to you. And so let me quickly tell you the format. This is 90 minutes. Um, and uh, after my introduction, all the five panelists will get three to five minutes only to speak on their subject. I will do a round and an introduction with them with follow-on questions, focusing on the how. And then um, that will take about an hour and then about 25 minutes, uh, I hope that all of you in the audience to whom I call out a salute, thank you for joining in such large numbers. Please let's make it interactive. I will constantly be looking for your questions. I'll group them 
and ask the panelists your questions so that you are part, very much part of this uh, program called Keep the Change. And we'll keep it lively. We'll keep, keep it positive for just one and a half hours. We're gonna focus on all the positives. And so how do we keep the change? So thank you very much and let's dive right into it. So Veena, I'm going to you first. You have five minutes to tell us what has changed for the positive on environmental issues in the city? Sure. So I think firstly, um, the first thing that, that struck us for from the entire uh, shutdown was, and I think everybody and every newspaper has carried stories about this, and nobody ever thought that Bangalore could go back so quickly to what it used to be in the, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, uh, and, you know, a city with very few cars on the street, you could hear, hear the bird song, the rivers were clean and so on. And so I think that the major changes that we've kind of uh, seen are in air, water, and then um, also in, in bird song. So I'll give you a little bit of data since Roni asked us to give us, give data, um, is that we, uh, my colleague Priyanka did a survey of the Rishbhavati River. And what she found was that, of course, there is sewage in the water. I mean, the sewage hasn't gone away because we still have issues with sewage treatment plants and so on. But the impact of the industrial shutdown for a month when compared pre-COVID and post-COVID was quite dramatic. And so the sewage hadn't changed within the city, but the minute you went downstream of the city towards Bairamangla uh, Reservoir, which is where the Rishbhavati flows into, you start seeing some substantial improvements in water quality. And it's very, very dramatic. So almost a, a you know, five-fold decrease in the uh, BOD, what's called the biological oxygen demand, which is a way to, um, to quantify the, the poor quality of the water. So, high, so almost a five-fold decline in biological oxygen demand and chemical oxygen demand. And that kind of suggests that it's not sewage. I mean, sewage is an issue, but it's the lack, the loss of, uh, self-cleansing ability, uh, which the industrial effluence had been causing. And uh, and I personally did not expect to see such a dramatic uh, improvement. When I looked at her data, I was quite, uh, I was quite amazed at how dramatic it was. So clearly the story of clean water is, is not just hearsay, it shows up in the data and it tells us something very real of what the kind of industrial activity we had been doing, um, uh, the kind of damage it had been creating. Uh, I think the data on air is equally dramatic. I mean, uh, the reports show about 65, 70% decline, uh, improvement in the air quality uh, indices. And again, that's, I mean, it's palpable. We don't need the data, we can all see it. Uh, and the last piece is just people kind of talking about what they're experiencing with the improvement in bird song. Uh, and, 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 you know, I don't have numbers because obviously, one of the things with, uh, with bird song is you've got to be outside to enjoy it. And so maybe uh, there's, you know, all those, uh, all those newspaper articles that said humans are inside and therefore the birds are out um, are, are very true, but not as quantifiable. But I think everybody from that I've interviewed and talked to has kind of mentioned the different species that they've seen that they hadn't seen before. So I think uh, the improvements to, um, uh, to the environment in air quality, dramatic and significant. Now the question, small lessons and big lessons. So one of the things, of course, we need to understand is we haven't changed anything structurally in our economy. Uh, we haven't changed the policies uh, that would replace uh, ecologically destructive production. We haven't changed our uh, uh, policies that would prevent mass unemployment if we suddenly change the structure of our economy. We haven't provided for universal basic. We haven't done anything structurally. Um, and so uh, we, the, the, the big concern, of course, is the minute the walk, lockdown ends, are we going to go back exactly to where we were? Or are there elements of these lessons that we can take forward? And I think there are a few lessons. And I would, I'll talk about two right now, and then we can talk about the rest later. Uh, one of them is just in the, main, uh, in the nature of how we regulate. So throughout, uh, you know, the, the past few years, uh, the Pollution Control Board has kind of been maintaining that everything that we were measuring in the rivers was historical legacy pollution, and there was no pollution, current pollution. And I think that argument has just been laid bare. And so clearly we can all, be, and we should be arguing 
that we need a complete restructuring of how we look at pollution control. Um, the second piece of it, I think, and Rohini referred to this a little bit in her introduction, is on the consumption side. And I think that uh, a lot of the, again, just anecdotally, I've been kind of doing a dipstick, and of course, everybody in my circle is also environmental, so it's not a representative sample. But to see, a, we, we've been basically stopped from consuming for the last month. And basically, I asked people whether they thought there were any permanent shifts that uh, has made them rethink fundamentally their approach to consumption. And the answers were kind of mixed. Some people said, well, I've really started to appreciate the small things more and so on and, uh, and so forth. Uh, but a lot of people talk, talked about the minimalism, you know, uh, channels they've been watching and how much more they've enjoyed, uh, the, you know, cooking at home and spending time with their family. And so definitely uh, an appreciation of a shift from materials to experiences and particularly really rethinking what matters to you and focusing on that. Thank you. Uh, which, so I think, yeah, yeah, we'll come back to you, of course, because in the next round, we're really going to focus on the house. So that's where you can pick up on some of these things. So um, maybe Ravi, maybe I'm going to go to you from here. She's talked about how, how water is cleaner, air is cleaner, consumption is lower, mobility is lower. So what does that mean for the city in terms of our public spaces, our planning, etc.? Please go ahead, Ravi. Uh, Rohini, uh, firstly, thank you so much uh, for uh, remembering that I had a civic event evangelist uh, past and bringing me onto this panel. So first, I'd like to quickly go through the lens of COVID-19 in terms of from a city planning spaces kind of perspective, what have been the key learnings? It's fundamentally been about the right to health and safety. And what have been the visible manifestations of this desire for health and safety. The lockdown has been the biggest manifestation. We have been taking hygiene measures. We have been asked to use a mask and many, I mean, nearly all are now using mask. And we have, we need to do physical distancing. I prefer that word to social distancing. So these are the visible manifestation. But for me, as someone interested in cities for over two decades, the most striking thing really was what was invisible became visible through the migrant crisis when we saw that mass of humanity on our roads. So suddenly you had invisible, which is very roughly 30 to 40 percent of our population, uh, the bottom of the pyramid, migrants, lower income, marginal groups and the like. And suddenly everybody realized, oh, they exist. And in some mysterious way, for some time, they have again become invisible but they haven't really gone away. The problem still exists. As Rohini mentioned, their life has been difficult normally, even more so now. And suddenly you hear that there's a seal down in a place called Hongasandra. You're suddenly worrying, is somebody from my house top made anyone coming from Hongasandra? Where is Hongasandra? Suddenly you realize that there's a whole other that we were taking for granted. There have been fewer deaths, as Veena mentioned, air quality, the quality of the lakes, no traffic accidents, less crime. But to me, the main message for the future is we need to aim for widespread prosperity for all, equitable development going forward. And for this, the poor and marginalized need to be at the center of the city planning. You know, like I, I there was from the WhatsApp University, I saw this poster which said, Hey, entrepreneurs, why don't you go out and create wealth? And then there's a little bit of a pause. And then they say, hey, oh, you now realize that you need workers to create your wealth. So the reality, the point I'm really trying to harp is we need to plan our cities in a manner that works for all citizens and not just for a segment of the citizens, which has really been the past model. And the related point is we need to plan for Bangalore, what's good for Bangalore, not necessarily global models. So Rohini, there are four themes I want to quickly run through. Master planning, mobility, public spaces, and governance. Master planning, my big point really is the model of land use and zonal regulations and of late the transit-oriented development. These are very problematic. They are dysfunctional and they have failed us over the years. The woes of the poor are compounded. There is no land title or tenure. We don't have a concept of social rental housing and that basically accentuates the problem. The solution very quickly, we, and we can discuss that later, 
we need to rethink our master plans to be inclusive, dynamic, spatial, and strategic. We need to get away from GDP kind of measures and get into life measures of air quality, water availability, quality, health, and the like. We need to think in terms of, we had it earlier, we lost it. The public sector units were really live and work for all, uh, for the people who, so you lived in the public sector colony and you worked out there. Somewhere we lost that model and then you had the IT parks and people from Vijayanagar and Rajajinagar traveling across town. The work from home is the ultimate integration where live and work is next to each other. Now we need to figure out how to make this happen for all, as much for us, as much as for the underprivileged, the maid servants and the like. And consequently, from a master planning point of view, we need to think of mixed use and mixed income. We need to think in terms of the across income groups, they need to be living across the city, not something that they need to come from 30 or 40 kilometers apart. I think this crisis has shown that. Moving quickly to mobility, my one concern there is that when we go back, the public transport might suffer and there might be more private vehicle usage and purchase. And this will bring back all the old bad effects of carbon emission, pollution, and what have you. Now, we need to adopt a vulnerable framework to address mobility. We definitely, the most vulnerable on the road are the walkers. And if physical distancing requires six feet, we need more space for walkers. This is not for debate. You can't just have physical distancing for people in private vehicles. You need to have it for the vulnerable on the streets. Cycling needs to scale up, and we have the weather for both walking and cycling. And we need to remember all the frontline heroes who have been working during this period, they don't drive to work. So you need to find ways to have public transport at least 30% utilization. So that's really on mobility. Last two quick words on public spaces as well as uh, governance. Now spaces like BIC, Rangshankara, Jagriti, Chaudaya, they clearly are going to take many, many months before they come back, understandable. But conceptually in our planning, we need more public spaces, not less. Even everybody needs to go out to larger open spaces. I'll just give you one data point. In 1995 CDP, the open spaces was 25%. In the 2031 master plan yet to be notified, open spaces is down to 4%, 4%. If you need a proof that master plans don't work, this is it. And if you want to achieve physical distances among people, find the open spaces. Think of NGF, LAMP factory to become open spaces in terms of things. One last word on public spaces is that my prediction as we come out of this and the people having experience online working, working from home, etc. More work related will get done online and remotely and people being social animals, the time that they want to spend with others will be with friends and family in public spaces. That's my hope and for that we need to be prepared to create more public spaces. Last word on governance. The one state that worked very well was Kerala. And Kerala worked fundamentally because they have a strong decentralized local government, institutions like Kudumashri and others that people trust. And that was this, there's a story on decentralization working. Even in Bangalore, it's the wards who have been the frontline heroes. The ward health officers are the people who are going and sealing those places, testing the people. If you need proof that we need more decentralization, we are seeing it in front of our eyes. But the current system is dysfunctional uh, in terms of the city being under the state. So we need to do that governance reform. We need the plumbing refix. We need deep decentralization and appropriate integration. I can speak for hours on this subject. I don't want to go there. My last two points, this virus has taught us about what is exponential growth. And to address this exponential growth, we have done one of the most radical decisions in our life, a complete lockdown of the country. If that is the case for this virus, why can't we do transformational thinking in terms of a new paradigm to demand a better city for all, which includes governance, building a city around the poor at the heart of it and the like. And finally, sunlight is a great disinfectant for viruses and for everything else. So similarly in governance, the more transparent you are, the greater the chances that we will get a city that we deserve. Rohini. Um, thank you, Ravi. Uh, that was a long wish list. <laughs> Be prepared because in the next round, I'm going to ask you how you are going to help make this happen. 
So uh, just sharpen your pencil till we come back to you. So um, let me cut to you, Nitin, to follow on from what uh, uh, Ravi just said. Uh, you, you please focus on what has changed in work, for which, I mean, certainly for the cognitive professions, but even for everybody. What, remember, we are focusing on the positive. What has changed for the better and what, while it has mainly affected the elite that I can sit at home and work, that also has positive benefits for the vulnerable, for the poor, because even if we can sustain some of that, it might help them. They can breathe easier. There'll be less congestion. So it's not just a benefit to the elite. Can you dwell on that a bit? We are talking about what has changed for the positive. Yeah, but uh, Rohini, but first I want to make two demands, okay? Hum cha, hum mangte hain. I think the, the, IT, the biotech industry in Bangalore has to innovate and genetically engineer vegetables that come in a chopped form. Like uh, garlic and onion and tomato and beans, you know, I'm cutting them every day. I'm doing the same job again and again. Why can't we have genetically engineered vegetables which are already chopped? Thank okay. you. Thank you. And, 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 and second is that if we are going to insist that people work from home, companies have to provide three things. UPS for the modems, uh, a dishwasher, and a vacuum cleaner, right? Uh, these will make working from home possible. Otherwise, you know, I have a car, the car is parked there, it's of no use to be to wash my dishes, right? So I think we've got to figure out the, you know, recombination of these, uh, of these devices and gadgets that we have. But I think on the chopped vegetables, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm serious. Like, I mean, this is, this is, this is personal. Okay. But, but, uh, but uh, more seriously, I think the gig economy uh, and the work part is what I think I've been extremely concerned about. Uh, the job losses uh, are serious, right? So when we're talking about work, the negative part is really serious. It's overbearing. You know, 140 million people have lost their jobs in the last uh, two months and the number is probably higher. Big Basket couldn't start their deliveries because although they had the warehouses and the goods and the technology in place, a lot of the people who used to work in Big Basket for packing and delivery all went back to their villages and towns. So they don't have delivery people, right? So I think this is a, the work part is fairly serious. Uh, but let me, as you said, we'll focus on the positive part. Uh, and I will again say this is also a biased opinion because it talks about people like us who, have, who can talk about this from the comfort of our homes at this point, right? So it's a very narrow slice of the working population uh, of the city. Uh, my daughter, uh, Ada, did a, uh, did a survey of, uh, of how people are coping with it. And she has some numbers. She and two other collaborators from the United States. So they did India and they did California. So we have some provisional numbers. I'm not allowed to tell you the full thing because she's not written it out yet. But here's some, here's some, uh, here are some numbers before I launch into what we can do, right? They found that about 20% of the people surveyed have suffered some loss of income in the family, right? So 80% are okay, but about 20% of the families surveyed, and these are people like us, right, uh, who have lost some income in the family. 45% of the people have found an increase in the workload. This includes schoolwork, okay? So they were, they were studying teenagers and young people. So 45% have seen an increase in the workload, but 36%, the largest majority, have found that the workload has somewhat reduced. Okay, so it's a mixed picture. So workload has increased, but somewhat reduced. 38% have found that their health is better. I think this is quite understandable because they are at home, you know, they're not facing the pollution and the angst and the, the tension on being on the roads. So 38%, which is a majority, have found that their health outcomes have been better. And their physical exercises has more or less remained the same. Okay, this is interesting. Um, it's just that the pattern has changed. So people who are jogging uh, and doing outdoor sports are now doing yoga and dancing indoors, right? So that's in the young people, that's the kind of change they've seen. And uh, to the question to say that, do you prefer offline to online? 66% said they prefer offline. These are kids who want to go back to school and people, you know, mostly who want to go back to their offline world. So while online is nice and all that, they feel that the offline is still something which they want. And here's what... I realize the value of the non-digital world. Right. Right. And here's the most interesting thing which I found, right? And uh, 50, the last question in our survey was, are you optimistic about the future? And 54% of, of the respondents 
were optimistic. They said, we are going to go into a better world. And these are young people, uh, teenagers and youngsters. So this is, this is really nice. I found that to be a good, uh, uh, good uh, sort of understanding of uh, uh, the workspace. But you know, what I think the COVID-19 pandemic has done has pushed the world into the information age with a shock. For 300 years, working was a lot of people gathering in the same place at the same time to do something. Right? And although the technology to change this has been available for the last 15 years, the mental model was such that you, know, you want to see the employees in front of you. you know? Only if they are in front of you can you, be, can you consider that as work. I think that model has gotten a big shock. Okay? Now again, small section. I know Manu is here. I don't think Manu can do remote working and provide food to me sitting in his house. But for a lot of other people uh, who, who, who work in the knowledge kind of an industry, and then, and then Bangalore, I think, is a large number of such people, is that the model of working, the fact that you don't have to be in the same place at the same time, has changed. And that's going to have profound consequences. Right? And, and, and Ravi will be, uh, it'll be music to Ravi's ears. The biggest profound consequence is in terms of traffic. Right? Uh, and that, uh, you know, Bangalore is a city united by weather, divided by traffic, which means now, that the, because the impact we have seen is on how we can get the traffic to be reduced. As we now build uh, the, the, the life back up, how do we now retain the good part of what we have learned? Right? Moving into public transport and as Ravi said, uh, more pedestrian traffic uh, and so on. So that gives us a ramp up to a better world. Right? Now it's up to us whether we want to take it or not. But I think that's, that's been there. Right? So uh, then the spare capacity can be used for, you know, because we don't now, going to Whitefield for a meeting used to be a nightmare, right? Uh, just before this, it used to be, a, if someone invites me to night, uh, Whitefield, I say, you know, no, I find, we, I have a toothache, I have a stomachache, and my dog is sick, and kind of stuff. But now, talking to people in Whitefield has become quite normal, because we just do it on Zoom. And the ability for us to do these meetings across the city, uh, prevailing over the divide, divisions created by traffic, both for work and for leisure, I think is increased. And I think that's something we need to preserve, right? So as we move back up, how much of this Zoom world can we continue? Not all companies need to work, you know, 24 by 7 uh, in the office. Maybe there are certain days, certain times, certain types of employees who can work from home, certain types of students on certain classes they can take from home, which means they reduce the traffic on the road, uh, which means that there is staggered traffic, which means there is road space available for other things. So I could go to BIC for an event because the road uh, traffic now allows me to. Earlier, if you call me to Chaudhaya again, I would say, why would I go to Chaudhaya, man? It's on the other side of the planet, right? As far as the traffic part is concerned. And the last point I want to make, uh, I think this is regarding the gig economy. I think a lot of our people uh, in this city are in the gig economy and going to be increasingly in the gig economy. And what this has told us is that we need to find some ways to provide social security to these people, right? And the social security to people in the gig economy can't be provided in the traditional provident fund method, right? Which is a single government, which is good. We need to find ways using uh, Aadhaar, UPI and the others, wherein there, are, there is an account which has multiple inputs. So the employer can put in some money, the customer can put in some money. For example, Zomato today takes tips and gives them to the, uh, to the delivery person. Now, can we use a similar model for people to pay into the accounts of people who are delivering stuff? Uh, can so civil society groups do it? Can philanthropists do it? So it means that you have a you have a benefit account, a social security account tied to yourself, uh, which could be a Jandhan account, could be some other account, where many people pay in, right? And this can be allow you know this can allow us to tide through uh, you know times like this as well as social security into the future. I don't think there is any other way, and this particular incident has brought that to stark relief. How are we going to how are we going to give you know money to people who are on the other side of the city? Uh, you know he's probably a person who works in my office. I want to give him the money, but if he has a Jandan account and a, a phone number, I can easily transfer it. Now, if that person doesn't, then we have a problem, right? So I think the movement towards uh, social security for the gig economy is something which which has come up in this uh, thing, and I think we have to uh, strengthen that aspect as we go along. Thank you. So a much broader acceptance of the need for a much, a much smarter security net, because if this is not going to be the last virus. And so 
the positive thing is that people have understood the need for that much much more starkly than before uh, thank you nitin many suggestions in there we'll come back to you of course manu i'm turning to you um, food farmers health nutrition much has changed in all our minds can you tell us more well, uh, thank you for having me here oini can you hear me clearly okay great i was having some trouble with my mic before uh, so yeah, I mean, for me to be on this panel is uh, is is a little ironic because uh, my sector is actually one of the most hit uh, because of the lockdown. Uh, it's it's basically zero and has been from almost the start of March when when uh, you know one of the first few cases were discovered. People basically stopped going out, um, and uh, I mean, while it's catastrophic for an industry, I think uh, it has shed light on. A lot of things that will change as far as people see entertainment, uh, dining, uh, and and of course the entire process of consumption itself. In fact, uh, Veena was mentioning earlier how people are discovering birds. If you if you if you, I mean, so why it's amazing. I have uh, I have these beautiful trees around at home, and there's constantly new birds I keep discovering. Everyone's social media is flooded with them either cooking or looking at nature. Uh, so you know that is that is one that's almost a paradigm shift. You never had families getting together and cooking as much as they do now. And uh, for years, I ran <clears throat> through through a private enterprise a promotional campaign called the Social Kitchen, where I was constantly asking families to get together uh, around the table, around the kitchen, and and bond because I said there is no better way of bonding. I mean, I had no idea that it's going to. Uh, <laughs> You know, be forced down uh, their throats in this form, but that's precisely what happened. So I think everyone's cooking a lot more uh, and uh, asking for genetically modified vegetables that are pre-chopped, <laughs> which won't happen. But you'll surely pick up new knife skills. That's for that's that's a certainty. So I think yes, that's definitely one positive of this is that uh, people, families are getting together and and partaking in one of the most base activities, uh, which should. You know, been sacrificed at the altar of conspicuous consumption, um, and you know, taking on the conspicuous consumption aspect, I do think that people are eating a lot more responsibly than they were earlier. The mindless uh, shoveling of biryani that had basically become the cornerstone of uh, Bangalore's uh, takeaway scenario has has uh, has taken a, a you know a few steps back, and for good reason. I think uh, because of the supply chain logistics being hit very badly for the first uh, 20, 25 days, there was no choice but to start relying on what was available locally. And I think that was a godsend as far as the acceptance of really good local ingredients is concerned. Uh, however, on the other end of the spectrum, the privileged, let's say, or the haves, um, were also seeing a change in the way they were consuming. They weren't only buying because obviously there was no supply anymore. But they started buying, uh, uh, as per some estimates, between uh, these are high-end stores which sell grocery. They saw an uptake of between 30 and 60 percent almost immediately, which means, uh, you know, gourmet sauces and ingredients that they wouldn't have sold at at that pace. I mean, imagine people buying capers off the shelves. Who eats capers in, in India? It's it's pretty rare. You know, they always say they take it out and put it on the side. So. I do think consumption patterns have changed and that, that gives us as people in the food business, uh, well, a lot of food for thought because how we, uh, you know, model our businesses going forward is, is going to depend a lot on how people, uh, you know, uh, will they be able to overcome the trust deficit that would exist in going out because our spaces are, uh, busy spaces, you know, there are a lot of bodies in there. So social distancing is not the easiest thing to do when you're running a restaurant. Uh, social distancing is actually the antithesis of running a restaurant in many ways, because you go to a restaurant, you get good service. And in India, where there is a slight demand for subservience in a restaurant, you want that server to stand there and explain things and serve your food to you. All of that is going to change. And, and that uh, is not uh, specific to only Bangalore, obviously, it's going to be a global phenomenon. Contactless dining is what everyone is talking about, 
which honestly takes the romanticism out of uh, going out uh, substantially but it will create a, a new a breed of very uh, you know uh, highly trained individuals uh, highly motivated in individuals running these commercial establishments so the game will change because uh, you know I, my industry will hate me to uh, hate me saying this but uh, because i have to I have to speak for the other side also um, is that we'd gotten to a point in the re restaurant and uh, eating head space where it was a race down to the bottom and uh, deep cost cutting p funded companies making food cheaper and cheaper because they were burning cash quote unquote was was leading to a very strange consumption pattern so that's definitely going to change and we're already seeing that manifest because you're seeing news reports about how some of these aggregators are going to uh, you know eliminate discounting uh, entirely and food will start costing more it actually should cost and i think that has tremendous health benefits also because that's the other thing i've been saying is that we constantly shoveling down food with such high glycemic index uh, that diabetes uh, poor health is is only a natural outcome of it so we're also going to see a positive shift in that space let me give you an example as far as absolute figures is concerned i also am part founder of a boutique cheese brand uh, which which operates out of uh, bangalore it's, uh, it's called bigam victoria we do natural kv natural dry cheeses they good for you we use a2 milk um it it had a cult following but a, a small following post the covid outbreak i think our numbers went up nearly 300% i mean that's that's a business's dream come true because we were an essential service we could continue operating everybody started discovering locally made really good quality product and i think i'm seeing that not only with that one brand but i'm seeing that with a lot of other brands um uh, cottage industries msmes which were involved in creating a uh, really outstanding food stuffs have now come to the fore as opposed to only the uh, you know the big supermarkets and whatever amazon could get to you so that's also a very positive change as far as the farmers are concerned unfortunately uh, to for me to be able to paint a positive picture on that is a slightly difficult one because it ties into far greater uh, economic conditions underlying economic conditions especially given that uh, you know the lockdown hit when the rabi crop was ready to harvest so the losses incurred were so tremendous that irrespective of whatever bailout package is provided to them it's going to and despite all the you know um uh concessions they get it's going to be a very long time before they can recover from that kind of loss so how that finally pans out is is really going to depend on how we consume as as large urban centers because we are the largest consumers of these products so uh, i'm hoping that it it's 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 a you know it's on a positive note as somebody messaged me the other day saying dude i'm at the hopcoms and they have broccoli and brussels sprouts and leeks and i said yeah you know that's because the guys the poor chaps are not being able to sell to restaurants the restaurants who buy this type of stuff are closed these i never imagined that hopcoms would have brussels sprout i said well that's the new paradigm and so there is you know it, it it's a it's a very large change and and do realize that the restaurant industry and and the the, the number of people we employ uh, between the the organized and the unorganized it's a substantial number it's one of the largest employers of people in the country also it's a gateway it's a gateway for the unemployable uh, people with with very little education uh, with no skills are very often absorbed into our industry and then uh, you know the soft training happens over there that is 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 a tragedy you know that that's a tragedy which i really hope we find ways and means of overcoming i know that a lot of them are going to become riders uh, we'll we'll probably take over the delivery logistics as businesses ourselves and uh, that that's going to strike some kind of balance so we'll be able to put them back into the workforce albeit in new avatars uh, just a quick uh, follow on to that on the farmer side uh the one positive uh, that i want you to uh, tell me if i'm right or wrong the new, the fact that maybe the monopolies of the apmcs etc may find a break so that farmers can sell directly have more choice we will be valuing uh, directly grown uh, produce delivered to us more is there a positive to think about in that very briefly Yes absolutely and i think there are uh, some company well some organizations who've been working very proactively towards trying to connect the farmer the producer directly to the consumer uh, especially in the horeca sector because we have fairly large uh, uh, 
uh, purchaser. So we make that economies of scale kick in very quickly. Um, I think they will definitely find a second win because they were pushed back uh, substantially because a lot of these funded companies had gotten into the game and started cutting costs down. So uh, that that may change. And if it does, I really think that we will be at the receiving end of, again, not genetically or modified pre-cut vegetables, but very good quality uh, produce. Thank you. Uh, of course, we'll come back to you. But uh, Tara, over to you. Last but certainly not the least. There have been a lot of positive changes within. I know, I know there has been an increase in domestic violence. We know the really downside of this. Families living in cramped quarters, etc. Right now, we're also trying to focus on some of the good things that have also happened, which it took a pandemic to bring us to our senses, perhaps. I'd like you to dwell on the positive aspects of what's been happening in the family and also in the community as we have tried to reach out just beyond our new, uh, nuclear family into those who are also uh, part of our lives and happinesses. Thank you so much, Rohini, for inviting me for this panel. I think I'm really honored to be on this panel. And uh, yes, when we actually look at it from my profession, um, largely we were all concerned about the impact of the COVID-19 on the mental health of people. And uh, the WHO had warned that there's going to be a huge increase in the number of people who are going to be having showing symptoms of depression and anxiety. But at the same time, it's important to realize that there's been a lot of academic research on uh, in psychology on resilience, which is basically trying to understand how people have adapted in adverse situations and why some people are broken whereas from in these stressful situations, but some have emerged even stronger and actually grown through this adversity. So I think it is so relevant for us to look at this. And I wouldn't, I would love to quote uh, Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust uh, survivor uh, from a concentration camp and psychiatrist from Vienna, who talks about our ability to hope and find meaning in, in life despite its inexplicable pain. And he called it our human capacity to creatively turn life's negative aspects into something positive or constructive. So I think it's so critical for us at this point of time to actually consider what are some of the things that we are actually seeing in the family. And uh, there is no research right now of what we can see it happening around. So I did in the last two days, uh, had a dipstick survey talking to various uh, mental health professionals, uh, colleagues of mine who are psychiatrists, psychologists, and psychiatric social workers, to understand from them how they are seeing uh, and experiencing the positive impact of it. Now, I do realize it's a biased population. We are not really going to be getting into the families that are disadvantaged, who are even struggling to meet their day-to-day -day needs. I am talking about people like us, who have experienced what it is like and to understand what it is that we are seeing. So it is not so much a qualitative, quantitative data, but the trends that we are seeing. The first thing, and most of you have already talked about when we talk about, is in terms of the relationship patterns. The time that we are spending together is unprecedented. We all had time, and this is something that almost 95% of my respondents talked about, that in our previous pre-COVID time, we only had time to rush around to get to work, and the time that we had with our families were limited. And of course, we had time and we spent with the family on weekends and holidays, but not this duration and intensity where we do the daily routine of work, fun, family, and home life without leaving our homes. The kind of things that we are seeing, kids are enjoying the 24 by 7 time that they have with their parents without school. And parents, many dual career family, family couples who had to rely on creches or nannies or grandparents to care for them are suddenly, for over 12 hours, are suddenly finding that they have to be having to spend 24 hours being able to not just do their work, but also be able to care for their parents. But what is one good thing, the common couple of things that we are seeing is some of the parents were sharing how they were horrified that they only observed that their children were doing things, behavior patterns or habits that were not good for them. For example, the amount of time that they've been spending on 
the digital platform, on the mobiles, on the internet, the games, they're not going out and playing active physical activities. So transitioning as parents from being parents for probably a couple of hours in a day or weekend parents to, to being hands-on parents 24 by 7 was not easy and many people are relearning or re-looking at their parenting skills and they never thought about engaging with kids in play not just learning how to play on devices or internet but enjoying that time together and bonding in a way that they've never done before it's also through this engaging that parents are also finding that their children are opening up to them and talking about things that matter to them. A colleague of mine was saying about her time that she spent going out with her teenager to feed the stray dogs in her community made her daughter actually open up about the cyberbullying that she was facing. She felt that in her usual busy time, she would not have had the opportunity to build this kind of uh, comfort for the child to talk about such things. And it really brought them together. So this forced isolation has also reminded us as how important our loved one means to us and to be able to take time to reconnect with them. Uh, with this newfound, I think almost 100% of all my respondents were talking about people and families coming together in ways that they've never done before. And this extends to our extended families. Because in our fast pace of life, we have little time to connect with our extended family within our own city. I have an aunt in Jakur. I probably met her once or twice in a year. But during the lockdown, the families are getting together on Zoom to connect with family and friends. And people are now saying, what I used to do was wish on a WhatsApp a happy birthday or a happy Diwali, is now having these fun activities together. Older people are talking about their experiences. People are saying things and sharing experiences. They're having fun activities which involve recognizing capabilities of people that they never knew. So relationships like this need to be nurtured and needs time to flourish. And these are the times when people are talking about the time they've had to build bonds that will definitely go beyond the lockdown period. The other thing that we're talking with here, if you're seeing, is that in terms of the quality of the relationships and mending of relationships. When we stay together in a confined space with the same people over a prolonged period of time, it can be quite challenging. And uh, But we're seeing that people are using this time to have meaningful conversations with their loved ones, based especially on issues that they often swept under the carpet. Because it's during this time that we start paying attention to the needs and issues of those within and outside our families. And we sharpen our sensitivities. We can then be a little more empathetic. People who have done this during this time, who have invested in meaningful, deeper conversations, have reported that their relationships have emerged stronger. Of course, it depends on the nature of the relationship and the complexities that were there in the relationships prior to this. Because I remember one person spoke about the relationship that he's had with his daughter was really bad. But they realized they are stuck together in the home together and they need to figure out some way, constructive way of resolving their issues. Right? Couples talk about breathing time to talk about their relationship, their needs. They have more time and space to reflect about that. We have deeper, meaningful discussions. What is important for us as a couple? What kind of parents do we want to be? What are your needs? What's important to me? I remember one person telling me, earlier my husband and I used to travel extensively and we really had conversations that were limited to logistics of running the home and a few things at home. But this time together, we are rediscovering each other, enjoying being with the digital company. They're talking about unresolved issues that was pushed to the back burner because there just wasn't enough time to talk about it. It also has recognized the need for tolerance, for being able to give and take in this time. Now, it is interesting to see that there's research done of people who experience isolation in extreme situations, like when they were in outer space, like in NASA. They all talked about this, that what helped them in this time is of being tolerant of others and being tolerable oneself, reduced that kinds of context. The other shift that we are seeing, uh, maybe not to the extent that we talk about in terms of bonding, is the family role. 
There is a slight shift being seen in participation and sharing of household responsibilities. And I'm just thinking of Nitin, whose now role is of cutting onions and garlic. With no household help, we are dependent on ourselves. And it is interesting to see the trend in the initial phase that a large number of women found it doubly burdensome because they not only had to do the work that they were doing, but they were also handling the domestic uh, responsibilities. But it has become a time for renegotiating of roles, of getting the family involved, getting young children also involved and help them feel the sense of responsibility. A young mother was saying that a six-year-old child who's now helping in washing up told her family, you must all use only one glass in a day because there is too much washing up to be done. The value of contributing, getting back to the basics, becoming more appreciative of the amount of effort that went into what our domestic help or other family members who used to do the cleaning and cutting. The other thing is learning to live, redefining needs, learning to live with what we need and not be what we want. People have talked about this consumerism and spending and indulging ourselves. But I must point out one particular thing, this whole need for being able to postpone gratification and be able to tolerate frustration of not having things that are beyond our essentials. That's a huge lesson that many of us grew up with. But our children had everything at the tip of a button and could get anything they wanted. Okay, Anna, we'll come back to you soon. Thank you for all the, all the many things. I love the part about uh, being uh, both tolerant and tolerable oneself. And uh, so right. um, all of you have spoken many, many words of wisdom, many suggestions there. Now we come to the harder round for you. And what I'm going to do is also incorporate some of the audience questions that have started trickling in. So um, segueing from uh, uh, showing more empathy, as you were saying, understanding the different, you know, the uh, moving away from isolation. Uh, let me take Prem Chandarkar's question and pose it to Nitin and you, Ravi, that now that all of you have spoken about how much we all have learned, do you believe that post, when the uh, pandemic goes away, when the lockdown goes away, Bangalore citizens will become more politically conscious thanks to all the things that you have talked about? And will they participate more? And how can we make that happen? Now, the focus in this round is on the how, please. Ravi, go first. Okay. So I think what is going to happen more than the political, I think you're going to find the middle class a little more concerned about where their top mate, their driver, where do they live? How do they get their water? Do they get running water? Because what this COVID-19 has shown that everybody can be a risk to someone else. Now, till yesterday, that was not something that anybody cared about. So what I'm hoping for, and I think it will happen, is there'll be a greater concern as to how do the marginalized live? If they, and, and what are the conditions out there? And that I feel, could drive a potential change. According to me, no change is going to happen unless there's unrelenting demand from the street. You have to pressurize and ask for it. My point really, as I mentioned earlier, lockdown you did. What's the problem in being unreasonable about fixing the city the right way? So to me, the starting point is a, is a really, if you might think so as a campaign, that I am actually interested really in the marginalized a lot more than I was before this COVID-19. Not because I was interested in them now, because that impacts me in my living. So it's enlightened self-interest that will drive the fact that unless the, the boat lifts all, it is not. And so actually we talk about a trickle-down economy. I don't know what the comp, uh, I mean, Nitin might be able to help. It's a trickle-up uh, thing that's going to happen. A better life for the underprivileged and the marginal is actually going to lead to a better life for the upper classes. So it's really a trickle up by improving their lot. And I think if we can just focus on that and demand it, there's a greater chance of realizing it and political will come in the next phase. Nitin? See, I think how, uh, what kind of a future we'll end up in really depends on the various paths uh, that will emerge out of this crisis. You know, we are not out of this crisis. Uh, the, this is the first lockdown. We probably will have a series of uh, relaxations and tightenings. 
and uh, each of which is going to have economic effects uh, in various parts of the country. Now, because India is a large country, uh, politics is driven uh, at a national level uh, in terms of electoral composition by states other than Karnataka. Uh, in that sense, probably Karnataka will be a price taker uh, and a policy taker rather than a policy maker. So a lot of the kind of future Bangalore and Karnataka will end up in will depend on the politics and the economics that arises out of the crisis in other parts of India, which have greater electoral uh, influence in New Delhi. Right, which means basically I'm talking about the north of the country. Now, there are certain combinations of events which will take us into a better future. And there are certain combinations of events that can take us into a horrible uh, future. I am hoping that a greater emphasis on decentralized management of the pandemic. For example, the, you know, the red, orange, yellow, green kind of a, uh, of a framework. If it is decentralized and applied at a ward level, municipal level, panchayat and district level, we will be able to create the structures of governance that are bottom up. Which means that the rules that apply uh, in what we open up and what we don't, let's say in South Bangalore, might not necessarily be the ones that apply in Jaunpur district in Uttar Pradesh. Why should we have the same rules for Jaunpur and Bangalore South? Right? So if we can create the idea that local level governance is important as a result of managing this COVID crisis, we will be creating the psychology that look, a lot of these things are local things. We should leave it to local administration. Now, we have to be alive to the fact, and Ravi probably knows this better than I do, is that the local administration is the weakest of the three tiers of government in India. We have a lot more people in the union government and in the state government as compared to the people you need at the local level. So the local governments are understaffed in terms of money, in terms of manpower, in terms of talent, in terms of influence. How are we going to correct this balance? So COVID-19, in terms of the way we are managing it, there is a possibility. Okay, I'm saying this is a possibility because people like us have made a case that, look, don't have a national level policy, decentralize it, allow it to local level uh, authorities to determine what to open up, when to open up, when to close and all that. If that idea gets purchased in the next six months, I think we'll be creating the first stage towards real local level governance. Now, so, if that idea doesn't get purchased, then we are in trouble. So, so again, because it's how, either you or Ravi, Ravi, how can we build that demand that allows local politicians to step up to the plate. How? How will we give us two, three ways how we as citizens, because now we have realized so many things, what, how can we put that pressure so that more effective, contextual, decentralized politics can emerge? Yeah. So like Nitin said, center state is in a good shape, but local government doesn't exist. So it's a constitutional flaw going back then. The way forward, I think, is a modified game theory, which is the following. Let's work on the scions, the younger people across the political dynasties that exist. Let's convince all of them that they can become the mayor of the city because each of them believes they can become the mayor of the city. Because historically, Nehru, Rajinder Prasad, Bose, uh, Vallabhai Patel, they all started in city life and municipal leadership before going to state and national. Let's rediscover that. Give... Why will a state government give more power to cities? They will only give it if they believe that their kit and kin can actually rule the city. Let them believe they can rule the city because yeah, unless you unlock that state letting go powers to the city, nothing's gonna happen. So I, that's what, what I'm saying politically really is you have to, and our politics is geriatric. Let the younger generation start in the city and therefore, my suggestion really would be to make that case to the political establishment that it is in your interest and your kit and kin can then grow to state and national duty starting at the city level. Till that is done, trust me, if, we, if cities cannot be empowered to find their own destiny and they are not in charge, all these decentralization word, all rubbish, nothing going to happen. Ravi, thank you. Yeah, you took it very seriously when I said, uh, let's not focus on the negative and the positive. So you took the negative of nepotism and decided to convert it into a positive. So uh, we, I don't get into a political argument on that right now. We'll, it's worth chewing on that whoever, uh, if people understood that 
power could emerge from being uh, in the city politics, larger power, we could change that and then local people could hold local politicians accountable. Thank you, that takes me to Veena. Veena, everyone wants better water and better air. Now, and we've experienced it. So now you, nobody can fool us. We know how come the city so quickly became cleaner air-wise and water-wise. Now, give us three or four things. They may be difficult, but give us the path as to how citizens can get involved in keeping our air and water cleaner. Give us the steps. They may be difficult. They may not happen overnight. We want to hear the possibility of solutions. So I think, uh, again, I'm going to kind of uh, divide it into two parts. Uh, one is what citizens can do on their own for their personal choices. And the other is what citizens can do in holding government accountable. Because these are two different roles that individuals play uh, in, in daily life. So I think on the personal choices front, as I said, I don't know whether there's going to be a fundamental transformation of people. Uh, but I think that what you see uh, is at least the don't do extremely stupid stuff uh, change. And I really hope that would happen because earlier what we were doing uh, is, was really insane. So I, I remember that just a week before uh, the, you know, the thing shut down, uh, the lockdown happened, I flew to Delhi for one meeting uh, and then to there, I mean, I flew to Dehradun for one meeting for of just three hours. And it was some insane number of flights which then got cancelled and rerouted and all kinds of stuff. And actually, there was absolutely no need. And the week before that, I did the same thing with, with, in Delhi. And just think about the amount of pollution uh, generated, which could have been completely avoided if it was only a mindset, because that was a, a half an hour presentation before a national committee, which could have just happened by Zoom. It's just that the culture didn't exist and the mindset didn't exist. So I'm hoping the first thing on the productivity on the work uh, and the consumption choice is that I'm hoping people will just stop doing the completely unnecessary, unnecessary stupid stuff. Um, on, the, on the holding government accountable, um, I think, as you said, people have experienced that, uh, that air can be cleaner. And I'm hoping that what this will then account is for people to call out uh, the Pollution Control Board, for example, when they say that there is no new pollution, this is all legacy pollution, for example. Right? Because nobody knew before and now everybody has seen it and experienced it. So clearly this river was capable of self-cleansing, the air was capable of self-cleansing. And so I think what you're going to see, and I hope, is that people will be able to call government out um, and uh, you're going to be able to see a little more of the citizen action, partly because, I mean, you of course need that a policy piece that Ravi Chandra and Nitin were talking about in the sense that if you don't have empowered citizens, then they can't do anything. They don't have, feel like they have a stake in government. So you do need to have that reinvestment in local politics because otherwise citizens just get, can just make noise and nothing's going to happen. But presumably if you see greater decentralization, you're going to see citizens holding, at least calling out the bullshit from local agencies. So I'm hoping those two things uh, will happen. Some changes, and these are small changes, not big ones. There are lots of big changes that we also could hope and should hope because people have said this about climate change for, for longer and many, many articles have been written about the parallels between COVID being a fast crisis where people recognized that they were going to die tomorrow and therefore making, you know, the argument about climate change has always been, but we can't sacrifice the economy. And yet when we saw the threat of imminent death, we sacrificed the economy. And so when people have always been talking about a gradual, you know, a soft landing for, for planet, for the planet, and, and whether we will be able to restart that larger discussion on how do we get to a low carbon, local decentralized, um, uh, uh, you know, soft uh, pathway so that we can actually land the entire planet without having the million deaths that might happen because of climate change 30, 40 years from now. Uh, that would be the bigger change. But I think the first two small steps are immediately visible. Thank you. So it's a real uh, call out to citizens like us who have various privileges and have understood the connection between our privileges and the lives of others, uh, including small and uh, small uh, industries that might actually be uh, polluters, but need help to stop that pollution as well. And so Absolutely. We, if we can understand 
that you cannot just consume good governance, but we have to co-create it. Um, I think if that, that shift, I, I am thinking, will be an outcome, at least for some time. So um, I'm going to blend questions. Manu, there are two or three questions uh, in your direction. I'm going to tell you a couple of them, and you can answer by mixing them together. One is about farmers and how can farmers have the, uh, now the freedom to fix prices and how do we encourage local markets? And then third is slightly different about cloud kitchens. Uh, I, I don't think you can still serve us food through the computers, but uh, these three things, if you can very briefly answer because we have, we have been going, it's now 7.07, we are supposed to close at 7.30. And I want to get a few more interesting points out. So please, Manu. Yeah, well, uh, your first question about the farmers, which I touched upon uh, uh, earlier, and of course you'd uh, substantiated that. Uh, yes, I think uh, the, the growth of uh, the local ecosystem as far as farmers markets, uh, which is of course a fancy word for a little ma uh, mandi, uh, that needs to be facilitated, but it needs to be done through the ages of uh, the local corporation. The problem is that we've always been so averse to uh, any kind of uh, public activity, uh, be it using our parks to, uh, you know, uh, better effect. Uh, in New York, for example, Union Square Park is always the farmer's market, you know, every uh, once a week. And everyone descends there to buy really good quality produce, which farmers bring in. And, and that's the case across. Uh, in India, even the farmers' markets have become gentrified. So you go for there and you figure out that you're getting waffles and chocolate sauce, which is uh, kind of counterproductive to a farmers' market, to be honest. Uh, so I think promoting a lot of those activities spread across the city so there's no crowding in one space, which is obviously going to be a huge concern, that's, that's a good step. I think uh, restaurants, as and when they're allowed to open, um, We'll, we'll be faced with the survival of the fittest scenario anyway. And uh, I think the really good places uh, may just get away. And if that is the case, then they will be uh, the consumers of good quality produce, uh, which can be sourced directly from farms and farmers uh, or through an intermediary because between transport, logistics, etc., that becomes necessary. And some of those farms are not next door. They're very far away. Um, <clears throat> refrigeration logistics is another problem. Uh, I also do feel at some level that I, I think uh, meat eating is going to reduce. And uh, that's a very, it's a separate argument. It can be a separate debate altogether how factory farming is not only a great polluter, but also uh, possibly one of the reasons things like this have a, you know, occurred in the first place. So uh, I do think uh, conscious eating is going to, uh, you know, uh, increase the demand for uh, vegetables and, and land use for that rather than for animal husbandry alone. Uh, the second question was about cloud kitchens. Now, uh, yeah, well, you know, that's, that's, that's a debate that we're having internally uh, as an industry. What has happened is that the aggregators are posting a 60 to 70 percent drop in order volumes. So it's not true that the country has suddenly moved to, you know, ordering in. In fact, if anything, they're ordering in a lot less. Yes, supply is an issue because so many places are closed, but that still wouldn't have pegged the numbers of that because there's enough supply still to be able to be, you know, a higher metric than just a 20 or 25%. So I, I, I don't know if cloud kitchens is, is an ideal solution right now. And the problem with cloud kitchens is they, 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 they cloaked in, in uh, you know, in marketing. So, you just see a logo, you see a fancy menu show up on your screen. You don't know where it's coming from. So there's, I have always sort of, uh, you know, promoted it with a pinch of salt because I can say olive, you know, or I make it really sound really fancy and, and it could be coming from an extremely unhygienic crowd, uh, crowded place. So there will be a lot more audits involved in that. And I think uh, that's also going to be a new reality where transparency for the customer is going to be of people paramount importance. People want traceability. Where is my traceability, food? transparency, yeah. and and yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you, Manu. Let me quickly go to you, Tara. People want to know. We have questions, couple of questions for you. On uh, will it become more difficult 
to get mental health uh, um, access to mental health through professionals because of the economic crisis, etc. And if so, uh, what is the potential of taking the whole question of mental health and well-being online, digital, making it cheaper, making it more accessible? Very quickly, can you come back? Um, you know, I know it's not really a city question, but if you can also somehow link it to the fact that we have demands right here or something, and very briefly, please. Right, sure. There are a lot of initiatives that are in place right now. Nimhans has a telecounseling thing. I'm part of an association of psychiatric social work professionals. We have published all our numbers and people can reach out to us. This is at a national level with people speaking different languages. A lot of associations of psychologists are providing it and all of these are free of cost, right? There are people who are also being available for conducting seminars, webinars, Zoom sessions or not just about people who are ill, but how to cope better in situations like this. And I think these are very, very critical at this point of time. Publish, these are being published across board so that people, and I can tell you the association that I'm part of, which is the Association of Psychiatric Social Workers, have been reaching out to migrant workers, to people, fisher folk, to normal to middle class families, as well as, so it's a range of population that people are facing issues. And these are available free of cost. Thank you so much, Tara. That was such a hopeful uh, thing. And I hope uh, everyone took notes of that. Of course, uh, we will compile later, Ravi, right? Resources of anything that was mentioned in this and send it out. Um, so uh, let me come to you, Nitin. Uh, you have been asked about a couple of things. One is, um, if we have to be prepared for more lockdowns, you know, it might be that we'll open up, then something may happen. And again, you have to go into lockdown. How do we prepare? How does the city prepare for this mentally and also practically? Um, and secondly, uh, will we be seeing, because travel may be restricted for people across districts, etc., will we be seeing the emergence of more local jobs uh, for local people? Please, yeah. to, please quickly and briefly, thank yeah, you. Yeah, good question. See, I think there's a very famous... Uh, uh, Thing in philosophy called the Stockdale paradox. It's about stoic. Uh, it's about stoic philosophy. The idea is not to get uh, seduced by hope and optimism that this is going to end very quickly. Right? It says don't uh, you know uh, have the have the discipline to confront the brutal realities of the present while knowing that you know eventually you will prevail. Have the faith that you will prevail in the end, but have the discipline to uh, you know confront the brutal realities of the uh, of today. So we are not out of the crisis. But we will be out of the crisis eventually, maybe one year, two years, we will be out eventually. So during that point, I think we just have to keep calm and carry on. If the, if the, uh, if the uh, situation so demands that we get back at home and get into a lockdown and start working from home, then we should be walking, working from home. If it says that we can relax a bit, go and uh, you know, uh, enjoy even going into a restaurant with some amount of social distancing, we should be able to do that. So I think we should not let life be impaired by an overall fear and anxiety, but just carry on. But in practical terms, what does it mean? It means what I said in the beginning, I was being flippant, but you need to have a UPS at home. You need to have a dishwasher at home. You need to get your cutting of your vegetables, right? You need to be able to dispose your things properly. You need to have enough stock and reserve of food in case, you know, there is a, a, a immediate lockdown or a containment which happens. So you need to build some of these reserves. Our parents and grandparents knew this a lot better because they lived in and times when there were war and there was greater uncertainty and fewer things like just in time shopping. But uh, we've just got to learn some of these things. It's not difficult, uh, at least for a lot of people in Bangalore. A lot of people in Bangalore, it's not difficult. Uh, but it's just that mentally, we've just got to be prepared that this will happen uh, off and on over the next two years and just get on with it. And the second question was what I, I just... Uh, uh, about local, uh, about local, uh, yeah, local absolutely. Yeah, I think new creation, new, new economy. Yeah, local. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there is a general overall shift in supply chains. Global supply chains will shift out of China into other countries. National supply chains will move from national to state, and state supply chains will focus on the regional and the local. This is inescapable, right? This is the way we are going to use to manage the risks. So a lot of local employ, uh, lo local people will be employed in local areas. People from the regional uh, economies will be, uh, regional areas will come to Bangalore to work. What we have to do 
is to ensure that there is housing and lifestyle available for them. And I think what uh, both Rohini and uh, Ravi were mentioning, how do you ensure that they have housing, proper housing, decent housing in the city, so that when there is a crisis, they don't all migrate back because they don't have anything to do in the city. Right? So we have to not only create a physical home for them in Bangalore, but also a psychological and a social home for them in Bangalore. They should think that Bangalore is home, not the small village, you know, 20 kilometers from Tumkur. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rohini, can I say something in response to that? Because I, there is a number of comments about not, that we've not talked as much about underprivileged people. And I think that's an important point because all of us have been talking, I've been, of course, talking about about environment, we didn't just talked about you know moving back to local local economies, local workforces, and so on. And there was an interesting trend parallel on the climate side, which was happening even pre-COVID, which was this idea of deglobalization. Because you see a lot of particularly the European and American countries kind of saying, let's buy more local stuff, you know, and that was happening already, uh, motivated by the Extinction Rebellion and so on. And I think that one interesting uh, trend that somebody else on another panel pointed out was that some of these trends with automation, which Nitin just talked about our own dishwashers, our own vacuum cleaners and so on. A lot of the trend with automation has been any way to move manufacturing back to some, uh, the developing developed world anyway, because the labor advantage once you have robotics and everything's automated is anyway disappearing. And I think an important point that emerges that's always worrying for me as an environmentalist. On one hand, I'm promoting minimalism and I'm saying let's consume less and all of that's good for the environment. But I don't think we've quite worked out what's going to happen to what somebody calls surplus population, people who don't form part of anybody's supply chain and anybody's local economy. We haven't quite addressed it, but I do want to say that we, uh, we acknowledge that to all of the people who are posting that we haven't talked about and the underprivileged and their role in the economy. Yeah, no, thank you very much. As I said in the beginning, it's not that any of us on this panel and me, when I imagined this program, don't know exactly the stark horrors and the things that may go very, very wrong, even right now they're going wrong and may continue to go wrong. However, if you look at history, sometimes moments come when even the elite begin to understand their connection to everything else and start to make changes that have ripple effects that benefit those who did not have that voice before. So that's what I'm hoping will emerge from this. And let me quickly ask you in a couple of sentences, Tara, to say, we have been allowed to exercise our empathy muscle in these few weeks. How do we keep exercising it so that we don't forget how connected we are and we don't forget to really be politically conscious, socially conscious about what's happening to others while we are ensconced in our safe homes. How do we continue to exercise that empathy muscle which we have learned to do in the last few weeks? A quick answer and then I have to go to Ravi. Sure. Thank you. That was actually one part of it which I had not mentioned, which I didn't complete. And that is the fact that when we uh, the look at the initial uh, COVID response, it was all self-preservatory and, and, and panic buying to look after ourselves. And then it became, okay, let me look at what I can do for the world. And each, of, each person has found a unique way of being able to help the other person. And there is a huge psychological thing it does for you when you help other people rather than being self-focused. Now, how do we sustain that? Now, as human beings, we are people who get motivated by something that gives us joy. And this joy of being able to do the intensity with which we can do it now, we may not be able to do once we get back to probably a more uh, rigorous lifestyle. But that joy will not go away. We will make the time to be able to do the things that we can and uh, that we're given during the additional time. We find the time for it. Secondly, and I think that many people have been doing this in smaller ways, which without any credit, without any fanfare about it. But I think what is more important is the kind of self-satisfaction that they get and being able to realize the satisfaction that gets from connectedness with people that can keep this going on stronger. Thank, thank you. So there is a lot of positive reinforcement that they are getting and that can create uh, long-lasting changes of habit and, exactly. and perception. Thank you. Uh, Ravi, one quick thing to you, and then I'm going to take on Jenny's challenge. We're running out of time, but um, 
the IT, the big job creators, the IT, the hospitality, the garment uh, in this city, how can they, some of them have gone through really bad times with their people being out of work and struggling to give them their salaries, etc. How can these big employers, this is a question from our audience, become part of the solution rather than remain part of the problem? Some very quick things um, on that, Ravi, in, the, in our city, in our city. I understand. So these employers need to spend some time thinking about where do the employees live and where are they coming from? How do they commute? What is their life in terms of water and sanitation? So this, the CSR concept, what is to be parked in the CSR has to become integral to the firm's p &L to think in terms of that triple bottom line, which historically people have been speaking about. If each company did that, then there's a greater chance so it is not only the elected reps and all of us need to become inclusive in our thinking and planning, but corporates also, because as I mentioned, what are corporates without workers to be able to give them the bottom line? So they need them and it's in their enlightened self-interest. So I'm not asking for charity. I am asking you to do it to improve your bottom line. So your health of your people are very important. Their needs are equally important and you will make more money if they are in a better place. And that's the argument I would use to get these companies to think differently. Thank you. And I do want to say that clean air, clean water, better health, okay, decongested cities, reimagining public spaces helps not just the elite. It helps everybody in the city. And, and, and that's really the point that by making things better for us, how can we also make things better for everybody that we have very few minutes left but i'm going to take up jenny pinto's challenge she wants each one of us to say how are you going to sustain the change so two two sentences from all of you i'm just randomly starting from you Vina. what have you learned what are you personally going to sustain so i've been uh, binge binge watching three channels on youtube all three are minimalist channels. One, one is Pickup Lines, the other is uh, Fairyland Cottage. Um, and I forgot the third one. But, but basically, I've, and, and uh, Living Big in a Tiny House. So I've been obsessively watching those. And so I think that I've, I'm going to consume less. But more importantly, I'm going to fly less because I think that I was just doing insane flying for stupid reasons. And I would, I'm going to be more bold in asking people, can I call, can I call in instead of taking or really separating the wheat from the chaff. Do only what you suddenly begin to put a new lens on what's really necessary and what is not. Uh, Tara, what are you going to change and sustain? Yeah, one thing I've started doing is that on a daily basis, I call two people I know who have not been in touch with, who are probably lonely or not, who need that connection. But I'm going to make, make sure I continue doing that because I've seen the difference it makes to me when I connect with them. Right? Thank you. So Thank you. You want one more very quickly? No, that's, that's fine. That's Thank you. That's Manu, what are you going to sustain? What change, positive change are you going to sustain? Well, the positive change is that I started making my own dosa and sambar, which I never used to. So, I'm <laughs> testing on that. that. <laughs> Always used to order that. that it huh? also has to help humanity, your change. Sorry? No, the change you do also has to help the city and humanity in general. So, what, what, what change will you That's sustain? one, that's, that's, that's 30 less deliveries a month, no? <laughs> it's a snowball effect. No, but uh, seriously, I think uh, personally, the one thing I've realized is that uh, I've, I've become more vegetarian by choice. I mean, I think that's something I'd like to emulate. Uh, obviously, I'm going to turn my brands around entirely. But I think I'm going to be pushing that agenda a lot more because it's just, there's just so much excitement in that headspace. And, and I think that has a trickle down effect. Thank you on behalf of all the food animals, especially the chickens. Ravi, what about you? Uh, I know distances of two to three kilometers, I intend to walk. Even if there are no footpaths, I will struggle for the footpaths, but I intend to walk. And if Jenny Pinto will give me a cycling path to BIC when it opens, I'm happy to cycle to BIC. So for Jenny, if you're listening to this, I shall reduce my carbon footprint. And the last thing is, I'm also on a policy because I keep fighting for these issues. I'm really going to embrace this live and work, you know, where the poor and the social housing live in the neighborhoods where they work. I really want to push that policy initiative much more at a policy level. I want to do that because I realize the value of that live and work kind of concept. So 
So that's something that I hope to do uh, going forward. And I'll Thank keep... you, Ravi. Uh, Ravi, you are ahead, we are with you. Nitin, what about you? Okay, see, uh, it, at a personal level, I think what we found as a family is that we can optimize a lot of the things that we consume, right? In terms of reducing the waste that used to happen of various kinds, of food, paper, etc. I think we found ways uh, and the reason to uh, you know, save electricity, save water, save food, save paper, etc. And I think that's, it's, it's sort of coming to the family culture now and I hope we'll be able to sustain this. At least we are committed to try and sustain this once this ends. But on a more professional note, you know, there are so many things, this is an unfair question to me, because there are so many things that we are doing at Takshishila on COVID at, you know, from a national level thing to a state level thing. In fact, even opening up one of the things which you mentioned, we are actually designing guidelines for how should uh, big companies design their, uh, you know, uh, uh, reopening strategy such that, you know, they can get employees back to work in a safe and, uh, safe and uh, you know, secure manner. So there are a lot of things that we're doing. It's like my entire work life has become COVID, you know, it's 24 by 7 COVID. And uh, until this thing ends, uh, I think we, we're just going to pivot everything that we do from teaching, from uh, policy, uh, policy analysis to commentary to recommendations, everything on to COVID. Okay. Uh, so we are in the last one or two minutes. Raghu has presented himself. So that means we're running out of time. So I have to answer too. Um, I would honestly say that uh, it has been, uh, you know, an unmilan, an opening of the eyes. We feel tremendous gratitude for what we have, humility, and a very strong recognition that uh, we are all in this together. We can only come out of this together. So I, my feeling that I will intensify uh, my philanthropy, but with a new lens and hopefully more empathy and continue to do that. Um, also, um, you suddenly recognize the value of all the family members that you enjoyed fighting with before. So I'm going to, uh, I think, fight much less with various, especially some family members. And that I'm going to sustain. So, but to conclude before uh, Raghu just switches us off, I do want to say thank you to the audience. This was a very, um, not a very, I didn't try to make it too tight. and. Many people give many different perspectives. We try to get in your thoughts as well and your questions as well. I think that we have learned so much, people like us especially, and we owe it to both ourselves and everybody else to, to, to dwell on those positive changes and get positive energy from them and then actually use that to create societal change. I'd given the example of how um, when women started working during the Second World War, that never got it never rolled back. And there are many things like that about how we deal with our staff, employees, how we understand social welfare, how we understand health practices. Our good health practices will help everybody. I think if we can understand the positive changes and commit to sustaining them, I think it will not just be for the elite, but for all people in this city. And that's what I'm going to hope and pray for. Thank you so much to BIC for making this happen. 